Um, so we will go ahead and get started. Thank you all for joining us for our final staff hosted webinar in this series. Um, we are working to finalize some future webinars. So make sure that you're following us on Facebook or LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Um, so I will be posting the information there when we have it. But most importantly, today we are thrilled to have Dr. Tom Shannon, Vicon co-founder, legend in the motion capture community, oh, hey, that's boring. <laughs> <laughs> and all around fabulous person, uh, here with us to present on the topic of overlap between clinical research and creating more realistic character animation. Uh, Tom wrote about this project for an article in the 2020 edition of the Standard Magazine, which is now available on our website. I will also share the direct link to the PDF of his article in the chat here before we leave so that you can reference that afterwards. I have the YouTube stream going, um, so that will be available right after this. The recording will come to your inbox through Zoom. And then we have the Q&A section open here. So feel free to submit any questions you have and we'll get to those at the end. But with all that said, I will go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Shannon. Ah, thanks Alicia. And I'll try and get this machine going. Always being suspicious, being in the technology environment, always suspicious that the technology will never work for me, but let's have a go. So that should have happened. So uh, yes, yeah, thanks so much for uh, for joining this webinar on uh, on some thoughts uh, that I've had of late on how basic research uh, can help animators uh, to create uh, more realistic characters. Um, the central thread is that what we look at uh, today is just one of many examples uh, where lateral thinking can apply the research uh, understanding and experience from many different uh, research endeavors. Uh, to improve uh, the focus on, on one of those endeavors and one of those efforts. Uh, in this webinar, I'm going to look at some of the fundamental principles to create characters that elicit uh, empathy in their viewers uh, or disturb them if that is their intention, but also give some uh, examples of the traps and pitfalls that have befall befallen many uh, in this very rapidly uh, emerging art. I will look at how one aspect of clinical research uh, relating to the most prevalent spinal deformity in growing children uh, provided basic anatomical data and insight to train and constrain a uh, skeletal model uh, for more realistic uh, body tracking, uh, retargeting and, and solving. And we can use this as just one example where this holistic approach to problem solving in one area uh, can really help everybody else. Uh, we are a collaborative, uh, collaborative gang. So I welcome you from the Cotswolds. That's the, uh, that's the view of the Cotswolds that I don't currently share because it's uh, raining like anything outside, but uh, that, is, uh, that is where it is. I'm, uh, I'm locked away like everybody else, um, scribbling and so on and so forth. I give you a, ca a caveat uh, because you're coming from many different areas. I do utilize the, um, information about the Pleistocene Epoch. Uh, there's some clinical stuff. Uh, there will be some zombies, there'll be some clowns, and there will be some uncanny valley imagery that I'm hoping to use to explain some of the research contracts, uh, concepts. And uh, uh, you may not wish to observe any of those. And so uh, feel free to uh, cut and run at, at, at this instant if, if the mood so takes you. So let's have a think about human perception. Uh, they can best be described as organizing, identifying, and in interpreting chemical and physical nervous stimuli from the senses to understand their environment. We have um, chemoreceptors, taste and smell, the gustatory system. We have photoreceptors, uh, gives us sight. We have mechanoreceptors, which give us sound and uh, cutaneous attention on our, on our skin. We have proprioceptors, and these are the senses um, situated on the nerve endings of the inner ear, muscles, skin, joints, tendons, and other tissue. Um, and uh, can, uh, kinesthesia is the sense of balance, self-movement, and, and body position. We have thermoreceptors, so we can sense temperature, and we have nociceptors that sense pain. But let's go back 
to the humble fly to, to look at uh, the concept of situational awareness and how do you in fact catch a fly. So sensors need to be integrated into a brain to provide a response uh, by that organism to their surroundings. A fly reacts to the presence of a potential threat from a single direction by flying away from it. That's how they survive. But if you cup your hand so the fly sees a threat from multiple directions at once, uh, its brain basically overloads and it cannot process the data and so is caught. So that is how the, that is, that is the very basic uh, sensory responses. Fortunately, uh, we are better prepared for such, uh, such things. And that we have five cognitive domains to try and assess and interpret the uh, information from the many sensors that are, that are hitting our brain all at the same time. And they include concentration or attention, um, speed, so psychomotor speed and accuracy, uh, remembering, so we have episodic memory, uh, planning and strategy, so executive functions. Uh, we have calculation and problem solving. And together, the 90% of human cognition and is universally applicable regardless of age, gender, or health status. And this is, is how we have uh, evolved to where we are now. So we also need to worry about situational awareness in, in a given environment. We need, to, we need to understand what is a food source and what is a threat where we might be the food source. So researchers drawing on archaeological findings during the course of the Pleistocene age have uh, started investigating social evolution and the perception of familiarity, similarity and attraction among groups. If I remember that age is 2.75 million years ago to 12,000 years ago. But then Masahiro Mori came up with a really interesting concept of the uncanny valley. And could, the, could his work explain a phenomenon that he first reported in the 1970s uh, from the Tokyo Institute of Technology when he proposed the concept of the uncanny valley to describe the, his observation that as robots appear more and more human, they become more and more appealing until a person's affinity or positive emotional responses are countered by stronger feelings of unease as they descend into his uh, perceived valley. The concept has been found to be equally valid when applied uh, to the creation of characters uh, or avatars in the film, games, and virtual reality market sectors. Viewers are capable of empathy with humanoid robots or avatars, such as the, if you're up to be in the UK, on the top left hand side, the Channel 4 Silver Avatar advert using human motion capture data streams uh, to uh, a telephone company's. Um, friendly uh, character on the bottom left-hand side, uh, up to very human-like uh, robots can still simulate empathy as long as the audience recognizes that they're actually robots. As you can see on the graph, we're starting to move up the change of familiarity uh, and we're still away from uh, falling into, into the uncanny valley. But then again, to slip into the uncanny valley by a humanoid robot character or avatar, does not require much change to generate an unease in most of, the, of a viewing audience. And uh, just here are some examples uh, taken straight off, off the web. But sometimes the intention is deliberate to create unease uh, with the creation of zombies or vicious clowns, uh, particularly um, for those suffering from a cholerophobia or a fear of clowns. But there have been some accidental slides into the Uncali Valley, and it's not a historical problem. There are some uh, recent examples. As you can see, the focus on these images are of the face, but equally uh, recognize most of us will instantly recognize errors in motion capture of, uh, of the body and peripheries, such as the hands and fingers, uh, which at best will distract or annoy, but worse, slip us into the valley, uh, all emotions weakening our enjoyment of, of the presented work. Interestingly, studies of uh, Banruka, Banraku puppets in, in Japan do not elicit unease in most viewing audiences, so, so they, they lie on the other side of the valley. 
But studies have also shown that disabled or those exhibiting disease do also not lie within the valley. They are, consider, they, they are familiar as most people will maintain uh, human empathy. What I'd like to now show you is an amazing example of an early uh, motion capture by Remy Brun of Attitude Studios in Paris. And this was actually achieved in uh, 1995. What were you doing in this prohibited area? I was trained to be noticed. You get a kick out of doing that. I like people to be interested in me. Don't you? Stop playing games, miss. First name, last name, age and occupation. Okay. My name is F. Solal. I'm 23 years old and I work for Attitude Studio. Yeah, sure. I got hold of their files. They create virtual... Amazingly, uh, when she was fully rendered, she actually achieved a, a, a fan club in the in the mid mid to uh, late 90s. And I noticed in the newspaper just the other day, the Times of London, that uh, virtual influencers are now are now taking over areas that were traditionally uh, occupied by uh, uh, by humans. Um, these three images are all animated characters. But there is the elements of research that can come out of this. Um, this paper, the uh, a functional MRI data set uh, in response to a socially rich naturalistic movie, uh, the Grand Budapest Hotel, the contemporary neuroimaging studies are using these naturally sort, naturalistic sources such as films, avatars and androids to provide stimuli to accelerate research into a better understanding of how the brain processes complex situations and perception uh, whilst maintaining uh, experimental control. And this is a fascinating area of research uh, that uh, those involved in the animation environment should be looking at very, very closely because now we are starting to think as to why um, our, our audiences have empathy to particular characters or aversion if that's what we want them to do. So an exaggerated character can be accepted as familiar if the viewer expects it to be less human-like, but still uh, retaining um, recognizable characteristics. And for me, an example is the less high-quality characterizations achieved in the, or is, is the high-quality characterizations achieved uh, in the two Disney uh, Maleficent films, uh, made even more complex by requiring a seamless transition between conventional performances by very well-known actors and their anthropometrically different uh, fairy avatars. And this is uh, it's a, a piece on that on that work. Well, well. I shall bestow a gift on the child. Hi, I'm Mike Seymour from fxguide.com for Wired, looking at the tech of the making of the new Disney film, Maleficent. The film has a whole world of visual effects, but there's a second world of detailed visual effects shots that, until now, no one outside the filmmakers has actually seen. These completed shots are made and then discarded, just to try and produce realistic digital characters for the film. Matching fully digital characters, especially their faces, is extremely difficult. In the film, the three main flower pixies are particularly difficult and challenging as the audience gets to see them both as their normal life size and then as their smaller, cuter pixie versions. To make these pixies, the director turned to face experts and specialists, digital domain. The normal approach is to film actors' faces on a motion capture stage and then retarget those facial movements to the digital puppet of the smaller pixie, which has, of course, different proportions, it has uh, less wrinkles, uh, bigger eyes. So if the side of the actor's mouth moves up for a smile, then the digital puppet's mouth sides also move up. But doing this direct retargeting from the actor straight through to the digital character in one jump makes it extremely hard to work out what's going wrong if something in the final clip doesn't look right. Is the skin wrong? Uh, is the expression inaccurate? Or was it just simply that we didn't like the take that the team had selected from the original actress? Digital Domain took a much longer and more complex path to get from the actress to the final. But in so doing, it broke out each stage separately so that each stage could be individually tested. The motion capture data was coupled with light stage scanning. 
Now, thanks to hundreds of computer-controlled LEDs, this makes for a very accurate model of the actress, but also gives us something called image-based lighting. This allows one to view the real actress under any lighting configuration, or really under any place that you could record, say, natural light. The team then makes a completely digital version of the actress, textured and lit to look exactly like the actress. This test, for example, places her in the production officer's boardroom. Only once they've produced a perfect copy do they then move on to animate this digital clone of the actress with every single line of her dialogue from the film. Now, don't forget, at this stage, all of this high-end animation and final rendering will never be seen by anyone outside the production, especially not the audience. Finally, once the digital actress performs and looks exactly like herself, they then discard all of this footage and retarget that to the smaller pixie version. And then, of course, they re-render it all over again. The advantage of this approach is if the director wants to change, for example, the proportions of the smaller pixie, the team just has to retarget and then re-render. And it had a second huge benefit of allowing one to examine everything stage by stage, as if it was a final shot to hunt down anything that maybe didn't look right. For example, they could focus just on the eyes, or maybe focus just on how blood flowed around the actress's face as she talked. This whole approach of producing side-by-side -side animation may seem incredibly expensive and time-consuming, but it's really what it takes to produce a believable human face. Don't forget, subscribe for more behind-the-scenes action. I'm Mike Seymour for Wired. So let's now explore the concept of sparse data and how human perception with, out, with, out, with some very small amounts of information can build up an image in their own mind of, of a character or a creature. Remy Bruin, I think I mentioned before, of Adi who used to be at Attitude Studios and one of the, one of the major founders of motion capture, uh, moved away from that and started becoming a sculptor but he became a sculptor in a different way. And this is, this is uh, an example. When I can get it to move. <laughs> I will put money that every one of you know what that creature is. So as you can see, not only do, can we achieve um, intense accuracy to achieve empathy, but we can also achieve empathy through using very, very sparse amounts of data. And that I think is what is really, really exciting about, about this whole topic of human perception and, uh, and animation. So the goal of every animator, I believe, I'm not one, I'm more of a clinical type, is to elicit a desired emotional response uh, from audiences to keep them engaged with the story. Technologies now clearly exist to create realistic human-like characters to a degree where the subtlety of gait, uh, body language and expressions of emotion can be perceived by most uh, current ob observers to be aligned uh, with that um, presented by physical actors uh, with similar 
uh, behavioral, uh, physiological, and, and neuronal, neuronal uh, stimulations, uh, in particular uh, uh, empathy, which is what we're trying to achieve. We have all identified weaknesses in the anatomical re realization of humanoid characters that even recently would have been considered innovative and uh, uh, ground, uh, groundbreaking. Uh, for Vicon, uh, we were involved with Titanic and I look back at how crude those animations were, but they were fantastically exciting at, at the time. Uh, producers, creators and manufacturers uh, can continue to expect uh, ever increasing uh, expectations from their, from their viewing audience. Um, and so the, the requirement for improved imagery and reality um, will uh, inevitably in continue. So now I want to talk about why, why we've, we've been, I've been rambling on about this for the last few minutes. Uh, Dr. Jean-Charles Bricola. So in a recent example of the application of basic clinical research uh, comes directly to benefit animators uh, was the work done by Jean Scholz, uh, who is from Vicon, on modeling the human spine uh, to inf uh, further improve motion tracking, body tracking and solving. Um, he chose to describe the spine as seven hardy spicer joints. For those of you who are um, work on cars, that's the universal joint um, underneath the car that drives from the motor to the, uh, uh, to the transmission. Uh, so you can see it, it, uh, it's a, a highly uh, flexible um, joint. Um, from the vertebra prominence, which is uh, if you move your neck forward, uh, a little bump will appear on, on, the, on, on the top of your spine. That's the vertebra prominence uh, to the sacrum, uh, which is at the other end. Um, he added some slider joints in his, in his uh, creation but, uh, between each of those bones to account for the actions of the uh, uh, spinal muscles, in particular the erector spinae, uh, upon the uh, vertical col column. You can again, if you want to uh, breathe in and breathe out, you'll, you'll feel that, that action. But he faced the challenge to correlate the poses of the underlying vertebral bodies, um, which is, the, uh, uh, which is the, the, the vertebral loci of the spine with the spinous processes, because that is uh, what you, all you can measure on the surface. But he also wanted to um, create a sparse um, a set of, of surface markers, because you certainly don't want to be um, markering a, a character with, with uh, all of the markers you can see on, on that particular central image. Uh, so that uh, routine animation of whole body motion of captured marker sets uh, would then follow an understand an well understood uh, uh, clinical uh, pattern. But he actually needed clinical data to uh, complete his uh, uh, research project. But the, the, the data came from an unexpected quarter. And it came from uh, adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. Uh, and the need to quantify uh, back surface shape and the dynamic capability or their ability to uh, exercise among patients uh, di diagnosed with this uh, very common disease among children. Um, the spinal deformity can progress over time by simultaneously curving towards the arms, as you can see on the left hand image, but um, more uh, obviously uh, rotating. And uh, that uh, uh, forces if it's in the, in the um, thoracic or the upper part of the body, uh, creating that uh, characteristic uh, a rib hump, as you can see uh, from this image here. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but that is what we want to do is we want to find that part there in the model, and but all we have for the markers is that part there. But let's jump into another field and let's jump into, um, into uh, the plays of Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote a play on the rise and power to power and subsequent very short reign of the last Pan Plantagenet King, Richard III. Uh, and it, he wrote the play just over a hundred years after his death uh, near Leicester. Uh, and his portrayal by the playwright remains so potent in many cases become mythically fused with the real historical figure. Uh, suspicion continues to linger widely that uh, Shakespeare may, may well have been influenced not only by the political motivations of Richard's enemies, uh, but also the need to remain in favor with the victor victorious uh, Tudors who uh, supplanted them by uh, potentially applying some poetic license in his writings. So King Richard III. So what better way to provide a pretext for some Machiavellian uh, villainy than to deny 
uh, Richard through his blithe rejection of all things that the rest of humanity cherishes uh, because he was, as uh, Shakespeare described him, rudely stamped, deformed and unfinished, uh, unfinished uh, through a cruel physical deformity. Uh, but it also was to um, portray his uh, true motivations as, as hidden and very, very dark. And you can see in various plays over the centuries in the center one and to the one to the right, he's, um, he is uh, depicted as being hunchback. So how exciting it was uh, in 2012 uh, that Richard's skeleton was exhumed from a Leicester car park. Uh, the location was, did happen to be a monastery which was destroyed in the, in the 16th century. So he wasn't just chucked into a car park. And so we we're last able to discover that he did indeed suffer from a severe spinal deformity, and it was most likely a scoliosis. And that could explain the physical aspect of Shakespeare's presentation of him as, a, as the king, as a hunchback spider. So diagnosis is through excluding all other possible causations with Richard III's scoliosis and recently confirmed during an excellent uh, macroscopic investigation by the University of Leicester that concluded that the onset of the disease would have been painlessly commenced around 10 years of age, ending with a severe um, curvature uh, at adulthood, which you can see from uh, his skeleton here, and also uh, when they, when they uh, found him. That said, although his, King Richard's scoliosis would have been greatly impacted on his cosmetic appearance or his quality of life, as he exhibited a well-balanced curve with minimal ribcage involvement, his torso would have been slightly shorter than his relatives and, uh, and his right shoulder would have been slightly higher than his left. And that could have easily been disguised uh, by a good tailor, tailor or an armorer. He would not have been in, impaired by reduced lung capacity and therefore was no evidence he would have uh, walked with an overt limp. So the conundrum is, how did Shakespeare know this? And why did he choose to depict uh, Richards as so severely afflicted? And that still remains one of history's great unanswered questions. So Jean Charles's first challenge was addressed by drawing on research undertaken by Dr. Alan Turner Smith of the Oxford Orthopedic Engineering Center. And that was published in 1988, where he measured a selection of cadaver spines um, to create a mathematical relationship to calculate the offset in the sagittal plane. Well, that's from the side uh, between uh, the spinous processes, we can see here and here, and the vertebral loci uh, there and, and through there, the vertebral body. And uh, acquiring that not from scoliosis patients, but from, in our case, from typically developed uh, subjects and, uh, uh, oh, and can be patients. So how does a company, a motion capture company like Vicon know about scoliosis? Well, uh, between 1984 and 1987, uh, the company used their video camera expertise uh, to develop a personal, a pre-personal computer device. Uh, so it was quite soon after the first Apple um, that used basic physics and photogrammetry to estimate spinal deformity that was based solely on Alan, Alan Turner Smith's equations. Unfortunately, I have a, a clip of it. Now move it down your back to just above your pants line. Helen, I'm going to start the scan now. Try not to move for the next few seconds. Isis simply and quickly scans the back using the visible light beam to acquire the three-dimensional surface shape of the patient. The display shows the anatomical points and palpated spinous processes. And now a three-dimensional reconstruction of transverse sections looking from the neck downwards. The posterior anterior view. And the sagittal sections viewed from the left. Isis automatically corrects for tilt and rotational errors in patient positioning. ISIS now uses the raw data to predict the location of the vertebral column. So I was very pleased to, I think we uh, did a bit of good engineering with this one because uh, the last, the last uh, machine uh, stopped being used uh, for patients around uh, five years ago. So uh, it had carried on uh, measuring thousands and thousands of patients for uh, a goodly long time. So most Patients' minor curves do not change during their adolescent years, so are just routinely monitored. Uh, some patients wear a brace during adolescence to maintain uh, a spinal curvature, 
but a small number of patients require surgery to stabilize uh, a sudden progression of the disease, which can be fatal if left un untreated. But there's now a growing emphasis within the clinical community to include an assessment of an individual's quality of life, uh, interests and personal goals when planning a treatment. Uh, the inter intervention can introduce some physical impairment as the procedure rigidly fixes vertebral bodies that are normally capable of uh, intel segmental motion and affecting uh, global uh, ranges of motion. So a number of research centers have presented papers where they compared pre and post-operative forward and lateral trunk flexion and transverse rotation, uh, concluding that post-operative range of motion was reduced in both fused and unfused re uh, regions above and below the surgery when compared against that acquired from un unaffected subjects. So there is a drive, a move uh, to, uh, to see what the goals and, uh, and uh, aims of a, pa a patient are. The, the child on the left there is a, scoliosis, a former scoliosis patient who did undergo surgery and is now a very well-known golfer in the United States uh, based on, on this research. So Jean-Charles was given access um, to anonymized motion capture trials acquired from 30 typically developed adults, uh, which happened to come from my professional research, uh, professorial research rather than professional, uh, into the disease. And uh, all subjects followed a, uh, a common exercise protocol. So he was then able to train and exercise his complex model uh, to, succe uh, to um, successfully compare and to verify the performance of his model against uh, published uh, normative results, in particular, uh, only using uh, sparse data. And here is an example. Uh, coming off uh, Shogun, which I'm sure the uh, animators among you will re instantly recognize. So he's, he's successfully using a sparse marker set, uh, usually found in animation motion capture environments. And you can see that the merged clinical marker sets estimated locations as little square boxes, uh, the solving and tracking of the sparse animation, which are the gray balls, an estimated spinous process palpated markers, the glowing red balls, together with an estimation of the vertebral body motion. Um, so I think that uh, an excellent, excellent uh, research outcome. So the experience gained through this and many other studies uh, towards improved uh, body tracking and solving is now incorporated in the latest uh, version of Shogun software, uh, not the Spinus model, but interestingly, um, uh, the same uh, work was applied to the finger models in the latest version, uh, which I think is also mentioned in, in fact, I know it is, it's also uh, reported in the latest standard. So this is just one example of where multifaceted and lateral views of fundamental research uh, can give a very positive impact on the developments of a computer generated imagery as it uh, continues to evolve and becomes ever more realistic. I think you're probably sick of the sound of my voice by now. So let's just look at this. I find this whole area uh, fascinating after uh, in having worked so long in the environment, I'm excited almost on a daily basis by uh, the work being carried out within Vicon and also uh, in collaboration with many of our uh, colleagues and friends and the research community. So, uh, Lissi has mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the latest Vicon standard, which has a, has a and very thematically, and uh, 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 that shows the, the broadness of the collaboration of research across uh, the areas that we are all involved in. Um, so uh, get that off the bike on the website. And uh, are there any questions? Thank you, Alicia.
Thank you. So let's go into the polling just to see where we ended up. I'll end this and then share them. So it looks like mostly the a pretty good spread this time. We have the most in gate analysis, which seems mm. to be a theme. So we had nine attendees there, eight from VFX, uh, four from sports performance, and then one each for robotics tracking and other rigid body tracking. So oh, good. that's a good spectrum. That's a good it spectrum. Is. Let me screenshot that real quick. Always good to know. So it looks like we have one question here so far um, from Valentin. Thank you for your question. I'm working in VR and embodiment in avatars. We use motion capture to replicate the movement of the user to the avatar. Would you think that embodying an avatar with a deformity and the constraints of the skeleton that goes with it, which would modify the avatar's movements, would lead to a modification of the movement of the user who will be a healthy subject? That is a very, very complex question. I assume, <laughs> I assume you're talking about a, um, a, a spinal, spinal deformity. Um, you would have to, there would have to be a, um, a modification of, of the, the uh, model that would incorporate um, the reduction. It depends on the severity of the deformity that would, uh, um, that would have to incorporate the reduction in dynamic capability of, of, the, uh, of the avatar, because um, I'm assuming you're, you're measuring it off. For, or, so you'd have to pro uh, provide a modification there, uh, but also um, the, uh, as the, uh, as the uh, spinal disease progresses, the uh, spinous processes um, in the part of the rotation, the spinous processes bend slightly. I'm sure there was a there was an uh, image uh, uh, before on, on my presentation, so that would also have to be taken in, into consideration. So um, uh, a, a straightforward, um, typically developed adult model, which is what we've been proposing today, uh, would not entirely replicate. Um, somebody that had a scoliotic deformity and that that those adjustments would have to be put in place so that you had realism of that of that deformity does that answer the question hope so if not you can put it in the chat uh, do we have any other questions i'll give us a second here and i am just going to put this link to the direct case study in the chat and then I will also put in the link to the standard, the whole magazine. So we have 21 articles this year. So pretty much mm. covering anything that you can do with motion capture. Uh, and like Tom said, a couple things we didn't know you could do. So I always <laughs> like to. Absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Well, like I said, the stream will be up. And if you have any other questions, you can email us at support at Vicon if they're more technical. Um, info at Vicon, we'll make sure it ends up in the right place. And then marketing at Vicon, if you'd like to know more about the standard, participate in it, um, and to know more about other Vicon marketing efforts. But thank you so much, Dr. Yeah, Shannon. Keep, keep creating and researching out there. This is getting, this is really exciting stuff. Really exciting oh, stuff have, every day. It really is. We have one more question in here. Slide Yo. in. I am working on the biomechanics tracking with wheelchair users. Some wheelchair users do have spinal uh, deformation. Mm -hmm. I would like to know if there is any way to better track their body motion. That's a good question. That is a good question. Yeah, I think I think the the um, the challenge there is is. Um, is actually uh, measuring the uh, areas that are obscured by the by the wheelchair uh, because we're still uh, we're still um, looking at I mean we're still uh, limited uh, if you're using conventional Vicon um, uh, limited by uh, the ability of a camera to view. However, there is um, there is a parallel universe in Vicon which is I measure you that produces um, that produces IMU devices and. Um, there may be a way of uh, of attaching those to important parts of the of the of the patient or the subject um, to derive that data that doesn't require um, you to look at uh, video information from a from a conventional Vicon system. And I know that uh, that can that data can be streamed into uh, into uh, the latest Nexus software. Definitely. 
definitely. And if you want more information on that, um, support at Vicon or info at Vicon. Yeah, there's people who know a lot there. more about it than me. I know it academically, not <laughs> reali realistically. So yeah, they will know. <laughs> Perfect. Last call for questions, any more? Give you a second. Perfect. Okay, like I said, you can contact us through email. I am always on the social channels. So if you have any questions there, um, but thank you guys so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks. And thanks. we will stay tuned for future webinars, sessions, articles, all of the above. Yeah, keep creating. Yep. <laughs> <laughs>